I guess one of the benefits of getting old is that you become a little bit more reflective, or at least I hope you become uh, more reflective uh, about what, what you're doing. And what I want to do in, in the next 40 minutes or so is just look at where migration development um, has come from. And then I'll go on to say uh, towards the end a little to where I think it should be going. And that's why the beyond, I suppose, comes in. Um, because those of you who have not, maybe not so much the book, uh, but certain other things that I've written since then, I've been somewhat skeptical uh, about the whole um, jamboree around, around migration and development. Uh, there are many good things to, about the, in bringing migration to, to, to high profile, but I think there are also other, other, other issues too that we need uh, to take on board. And I, how I want to do that is this presentation is going to be like a football match. It's going to have two halves. And, uh, and I think that reflects my own, my own interests and the way that I've been involved in this debate. Because quite clearly, uh, I started out as an academic. But I've spent probably almost half of my career as in, in the policy environment, either in the United Nations itself or some of its specialised agencies as a consultant for international organisations and, of course, most recently for the Department of International Development. And so I, 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 I'd gone in and out of the policy environment and then come back into the university environment. So the, the experience, um, you know, I want to divide it into two, to look at how we've approached it from the academic point of view. And and then how to look at it from a policy point of view. So I'll start off in the first half, well, slightly less than half, will be on the academic approaches. And then uh, we'll have policy approaches. And of course, the buzzword. And when I was in DFID, everything had to be evidence-based. Policy must be based on evidence. Well, is it? Or is it policy-based evidence? In other words, we have a policy and then we scrabble around and we look for the evidence to justify it. Or even better, even better, is it evidence-free policy? Now, I put that in only with half of my tongue in cheek because I think we've seen major developments in science that are based totally on intuition. Somebody has an idea that's come from somewhere or another, maybe you don't know where it has come from, but Intuition, I think, is important. And I think I should emphasize now, and why the evidence-free policy is there, I think we have to be very careful not to use a lack of data for inaction. And particularly in the migration field, where the data are weak. So we really have to divide, um, design policy in some areas without the necessary data. And so I think the whole uh, evidence-based policy is a little bit um, over the top in, in, from many points of view. Okay. Now, I'm a geographer, so I have to start with a map. Uh, and just to make sure that I, I can work the point, PowerPoint, you see, up to point. Um, now, what on all earth am I showing a map of the eastern seaboard or at least in part of the United States. What's this possibly got to do with the discussions? Well, I mean, as you, as you all know, that until really uh, the 19th century, the settlers built up on, uh, the, uh, on the seaboard, and the Appalachian Mountains here is a major barrier to the vast plains uh, beyond. And one of the passes to the plains was the Cumberland Gap, marked on this map right here in Tennessee. So what? Why have I mentioned this? Well, let me start with this quotation. Stand at the Cumberland Gap and watch the procession of civilization. Marching single file, the buffalo following the trail to the salt springs, the Indian, the fur trader and hunter, the cattle raiser, the pioneer farmer, and the frontier has passed by. 
Stand at South Pass in the Rockies a century later and see the same progression with wider intervals between. The unequal rate of advance compels us to distinguish the frontier into the trader's frontier, the rancher's frontier, the miner's frontier, and the farmer's frontier. Now, when I read those words over 45 years ago, I was inspired by the simple idea of a series of functionally related areas moving systematically across space and through time. Now, I don't think it matters that the sequence has not operated in quite the way that Frederick Jackson Turner, back in 1893, had envisaged, or that it didn't, could not operate in different environments, such as in Latin America, because that's where I first went off. Can we identify a frontier in Latin America in a very different institutional environment? What was important to me was that one can conceptualize a series of linked migration and development zones or regions that move across space and change through time. That becomes, evolves quite clearly out of Jackson's uh, thinking. Not quite expressed that way, but that started me on this idea of systems of migration change. Now, staying in the 19th century, and there's far too much writing, so you just focus on number nine, and this is according to Griggs uh, ideas, migration increases in volume as industries and commerce develop and transport improves. In other words, migration increases with development. That's the words of Ravenstein in the late 19th century. You know, there's nothing new in this. And in fact, you could go through almost all the generalizations, so-called laws in Ravenstein's uh, discourse, uh, and you'd see that several of them still apply today. But that key one is the one that relates migration and development. And I think that first and foremost, when we think of migration, and this probably reflects my own background, migration is a basic demographic variable. And the central question must be asked whether a migration transition exists that is in some way linked with the fertility and mortality transitions. And this, this, this is something we all know. It shows you the two great transitions, the vital transition of changing births and deaths over time, and the, the transition towards an urban society that, we, that have been with us, really, certainly over the last 60 years. But the first person was Boba Zelinsky, and here's a little bit of history, where it's come from. And if we're interested in evidence-based um, academic research, this is, there's no evidence really here. This was an intuitive idea that Zelinsky had that, for, that migration was linked to fertility and mortality. And he drew up these little uh, relationship diagrams between different types of migration. Now, he got a lot of things wrong. Um, and the one I particularly took him up with was this idea of circulation starting down here, where fertility and mortality were high at, at very low levels and then increasing. And he read, later relented on that. But the idea of linking migration with fertility and mortality it seemed to me uh, was an important one. And I think I'll just add that there's two little panels at the bottom that we often forget is the importance of technology uh, in, in this development. But more or less, at the same time, in fact, when I was doing my field work based upon data at the local level, because Zelinsky's was a macro level, data free um, hypothesis, which you really didn't get hold of that other relationship that he argued for was the relationship between what he called modernization, in other words, development, and migration. That was never really sketched out. But what I tried to do here was I wasn't as ambitious as Zelinsky. I wasn't aware of Zelinsky's work at that time. I did not look at the links between fertility, mortality, and migration. But I was looking for shift, changing migration spaces over time. 
And I argued that migration in this case, which is Peru, which had a, high, a very clearly defined urban hierarchy, it evolved from series of short term, short distance movements through phases of complexity to longer distance, long term movements. Now, very linear, it's been criticized because of that. But nevertheless, rather like the models I've just talked about, I think that it did try and argue that here is a standard and if what are the deviations? And if the deviations become the norm, then of course this is completely wrong. And what I then uh, tried to do was to test it in, in New Guinea. But what I want to look at here is that if it's, what, what's the evidence for a transition, a spatial transition, and in this case it's fertility? Sorry that the, the quality of, this, of these graphs is not good, but you've got to sort of bear that, keep that in mind, and then I flick on to the next one, and you can see the importance of a diffusion out from the central plains, and with, well, first of all, within the central plains of Thailand, and then gradually outwards until fertility throughout Thailand. I'm not going to run through a whole sequence um, here, but what we saw was a gradual diffusion of lower fertility outwards from, uh, well, in fact, it was a central plain. It's not just simply Bangkok. Are the whites things lower fertility? Yes, the whites lower fertility. Dark is the highest fertility. What you saw in Thailand is the darkest were not around the margins of the state, except for up here in the north. Yes. Um, and if you go back, can I make this thing go back by rolling it the other way? Yes. You can see there's very little white. You've got pockets of white in the central plains. This is the area of Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, um, but the, the, this big area here in the central plains, and it diffuses out uh, from that. This is the work done by an American demographer called Bob Hannenberg. The interesting thing is one of the fir fir earliest attempts to look at small area data and generate um, a, a sequence uh, of, of, of estimates of fertility decline. Much more reliable looks at this one. Now, here... Don't so much look at the white, look at the dark, the black here. What I'm tr trying to show here in, these, in, in, in this map is the diffusion of small areas of intense depopulation. In this case, it's in, in, in Korea. So small areas of intense depopulation. And again, you can see uh, quite a nice diffusion outwards. In other words, I think this gives us some substance, the data are weak, but it's some substance to the idea that migration is linked in some way, that here you've got areas of intense depopulation brought about by, um, by essentially uh, rural to urban migration. And I'll come back to this example uh, in a few minutes, because I think what, what we're going on, I think this is one of my, uh, let me see if I can get this, whoops. Ah, yes, totally meaningless. This didn't work out at all. My bouncing ball grass. But now mind, I'm still an amateur, I'm learning here. But all I want to try and do with this bouncing ball phenomenon is this, if we can imagine communities at different distances from, from a city, it, these communities may be at totally different stages of a migration transition. Because I envisage a migration transition evolving down through a social hierarchy. And so, I mean, we could put this in a grid. It may not be linked to straight distance. It may not even be linked to accessibility. The, how, how quickly um, any community goes through this transitionary experience. But the point I want to make, that, to, to try and pull out of this, is when we are generating our migration data, of course, we don't stratify the data this way. It's taken from all, it's taken for large areas, generally, or if it's sampled, it's from all over. And so we're including, the, the data that we, that we take include communities at all different um, levels of migration transitions. We need to know at which stage in the transition any community happens to be at in order to make sense of this. And I'll come back to that from a more policy orientation when I come on to look at remittances in a few minutes. Now, well, let me just, before I, 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 I talk about that diagram, this next diagram very, um, very briefly, let me just take um, 
a hypothesis that Nick and Ollie will probably um, will probably recognise. Uh, and that hypothesis is a very good hypothesis. It says the previous the, the hypothesis goes as, as follows: the previous education level of a migrant has a positive mediating effect on whether migration helps to lift family members out of poverty. I think yes. I mean, it's a very reasonable hypothesis. I'd expect it to be proven. But the problem is that as a community goes through a migration transition, you're likely to get different results for that hypothesis. And as I will hope to show, the link between poverty and migration will vary as you go through this transition. And I think this is at the root of my plea, if you remember the, the conference that uh, we had here, Heinz conference last September, my plea for the importance of time and space. Um, I mean, Stephen, Stephen Castles argued uh, convincingly and very well for the importance of a toolbox, of multiple variables to be used in the development of migration theory. But I would argue that unless we put these tools in a spatial and temporal framework, we're not going to be able to use them effectively. So this was a first attempt, and first attempt, this was back in the book that uh, Matthias was uh, mentioned in 1997, uh, really sketched in the back of an envelope, uh, but uh, an idea of developing migration development regions, that the migration evolution is different in each of these regions. And unless we position the migration development debate with this in a regional framework, you're not really going to get hold of what's going on. So in other words, if we want to move the debate forwards, we're going to have to put it in some kind of regional framework of not, not just in spatial terms, but in migration development terms. Because the migrate paths of migration development could be very different here from here and obviously from uh, here. Now, I would, I would redraw this map today. I'm not using it as an example of best practice. It's, it's, it's had its day. Uh, it needs to be reworked. And I would argue that in the, in the migration and development debate, the biggest hole, the biggest hole that we have in much of the work, including my own, is the lack of much consideration of migration and political development. In other words, how do migration spaces evolve with the development of the institutions of the state? And I think that we haven't even begun to look at that. And if we're moving forward in this debate, we're going to have to look at that, and to, to look at the institutions of the state and how these influence um, changing migration patterns. The most, the most important one possibly, and one I did refer to uh, in, in some of the work I did, was the development, of course, of conscription, the institutionalizing of, of an army, a standing army, and the migration patterns that are likely to come out of those kinds of policies. Well, generally, generally, you can see I'm not really reticent, as some researchers happen to be, about the use usefulness of a kind of overarching theory of migration. I'm still one of those types that, yes, let's go for it. It doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, but it helps us in uh, crystallizing our thinking, rather in the same way as Zeltonov's theory of the frontier and Zelensky's idea of um, the mobility transition. Now, if I, if I try to talk to my policy colleagues about a migration transition systematically evolving in time and across space, eyes begin to glaze over. This is not something that is easy to grasp. I think possibly even academically. It's not, maybe, well, I, I don't know, you can tell me, but certainly it's not something that, how can you do, you need to get hold of something. Let's talk about remittances. We can deal with that. 340 billion, yes, we can devise policies. Here, we can work on this. But a migration transition evolving in space and time. Yes, next. Um, you know, how, how um, is there any relevance from policy point of view? And here, of course, is the half time. I'm going to shift gears and move towards what we tend to understand as migration, as the policy approaches in this migration development today. I just want very quickly to run through why I think it's become important. Because my, I, mean, I, I make it quite clear that you know, this importance evolved out of the discussions of development 
uh, leading up into the de Millennium Development Goals. And somewhere, um, someone at that time, well, migration's not there. Perhaps possibly it should be, and there was a debate. But migration shouldn't be there, because you would never, ever get nations to sit down and agree on migration targets. The only MDG that I could ever give you is that let's aim to reduce the fear that migration causes by 50% by the year 2015. But that's idealistic thinking. You know, let, 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 let's, so it should not be an MDG. But then why did migration development come to the top of the agenda? And I think this, this really positions us in where we need to go if we're going to move the debate forward. Because in fact, it is a smokescreen, or it seems to me that it's a smokescreen. Because you cannot get states to sit around a table and discuss migration. That is not on the agenda. People will never get agreement because nobody agrees. Do you want to increase migration? Do you want to decrease migration? Are you going to take our migrants back? Are you going to recruit our migrants? It's a big mess. And you will never get really a migration debate amongst states. But, but everybody's for development. Everybody's for development. So if we could link migration with development, ah, we can sit around the table and discuss things. But in fact, they don't really discuss migration and development at all. They discuss migration because who goes to these meetings? Home office people, immigration people. Do they know anything about development? No. So in fact, the migration and development debate is really, uh, it's not happening because we don't have the development people there. Well, all right, so let's look to see a little ways how this debate has evolved at the policy level because to begin with, people thought, aha, uh -huh, there are poor areas out there, people are leaving poor areas and they're coming to us. All we need to do is to develop these poor areas and they'll stop coming. Well, all the evidence, if we are looking at evidence-based policy, all the evidence clearly shows that's wrong. Initially, and in fact, I push it a little bit further than that. There's a positive relationship between migration and development. As countries develop, migration increases. But of course, most, more recently, we've been more ambitious. If that's the case, then can we use migration to promote development? And remember, going back to the origins of the academic debate, migration evolves out of development, not the other way around. So whether we can manipulate migration in order to achieve a development objective is much, much less clear to me. And that's what I want to do in the next few min minutes. Because quite clearly, it's, the main components of the debate are remittances, skilled migration, and diaspora. And let me look very quickly at each of these in turn. Now, remittances, 340 billion US dollars a year going back to developing countries. I've got far too many words on this, but never mind. Let me try and run through this. I mean, yes, it can help to reduce poverty, but the evidence shows that not as much as you might expect. Some of the best evidence, I think, comes from World Bank surveys run in Latin America. And yes, you see the positive impact that uh, dropout rates from, from school, uh, that the association between uh, re remittances received and uh, increased schooling, it's there. Uh, the, the evidence of it, remittances received and increased use of health services. Yes, it's there, but it's not as great as you might anticipate. Because the nature of the migration process, as obviously from what I'm saying, is important. And we know that migration, and particularly international migration, I'll come back to the link between the two migrations later on, but the, the, the debate on migration and development is fundamentally about international migration. And the origins of international migration in the developing world are highly concentrated. Highly concentrated. And in fact, somebody showed some very interesting graphs yesterday of the post-2004 migration out of Poland. And the origins of migration in Poland are highly concentrated. It fits the model. So the remittances, the remittances are going to very specific parts of those countries. They're not being distributed within, uh, within the countries as a whole. And here let me give one of my favorite examples, and that's international migration and uh, international remittances to Peru. IOM figures 
our evidence, if you like, um, suggests that 87% of remittances received by Peruvians from international sources go to urban go to the urban sector. 57% is to, to Lima. Now, the, what we don't know, what we don't know is I put, added on here chain remittances. <coughs> What we don't know is whether the remittances are sent from, let's say, New York to Lima, to, proof, to, to families in Lima, who then send them back to Cusco or Huancayo in the high Andes. We don't know that. My intuitive feeling would be that that's relatively unimportant. Now, I don't know why I say that, because I don't have the evidence to prove it one way or the other. Except when I look at the demographic profile, which I'll show you in a few minutes, of a uh, rapidly depopulated uh, community. But it's a possibility that those remittances from international sources go to the urban areas and then are reset back to... Uh, back to communities. It's possible. At Maastricht University, perhaps Hein has come across this, uh, Melissa Siegel is actually very interested in trying to follow these chain remittances, but she can't find the data. Very difficult uh, to, to find adequate data, remittances received and then resend. Remittances from internal sources, because let's because remittances may not, in absolute numbers, may not be as important as from international sources, but there may be more of them going to more places of origin. And so from a developmental point of view, that may be more important. But this is where, again, I think the issue of a time space comes in. And we need to incorporate this into our thinking. Because remittances and the pattern of remittances we, we, assume, we seem to assume that, first of all, they are robust. And the evidence we've got up until now suggests that, yes, they are robust and they are increasing. But will they increase indefinitely? Or will we see declines in remittances as we go through the generations? In other words, what I'm suggesting here, so if you can think of one, think back to my bouncing ball and initial migration from one of those balls to a city. Internal remittances will be sent back, but as the migration increases, then there are fewer people to send remittances back to. I'm thinking, I'm going ahead very quickly, rapid, um, moving forward. And so the remittances may decline. When we saw when we looked at, or rather when Eric Mobrand looked at remittances in the Republic of Korea, once mass migration to the cities had begun, he found that the net flow of remittances was in favour of urban areas. So there's a back remittances, reverse remittances. And we need to put that in a, spati a spatial account. I wouldn't anticipate reverse remittances to be that important in an early stage of a transition. But as migration evolves, then I would anticipate reverse remittances to become much more important. Very, very rarely do we, can, do we look at reverse remittances, either internally or internationally. I was initially told they're not important. My question was, well, how do you know they're not important? Do you measure them? No, we don't, because they're not important. Well, how do you know they're not important if you don't measure, if you don't look for them? And in fact, people start to look for them. And the best guesstimate of this, that 20% goes from India to outside compared, um, you know, there's 20% go, it's equivalent to the back. The net flow will be about 80% um, in other words, in favor of India at this stage of its development. But I think there's also remittances foregone what I call remittances foregone, that instead of sending remittances, you hold them in the destination and you then pull younger people from the communities of origin and pay for their education and their living expenses in the city. And that quite clearly was what was going on in Korea. It was money sent from villages to the city, but migrants were not sending 
remittances back. You were holding on to them to educate the next generation in the city. So in other words, here, here I think in the discussion of remittances, we need to look at some kind of time-space perspective. Moving on to skilled migration, many of the issues here are similar. Because quite clearly the skilled leave from particular parts of a country. They are not randomly distributed from the, from the country. In fact, um, the evidence we have suggests that they do not come from the areas of greatest developmental need. And I mean by that, the areas which need greatest assistance if they are to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. And I think that's how we have to define development, because that's how the international community has defined development. So they are not drawn from the areas of greatest need in terms of achieving the development, the Millennium Development Goals. The, we, we must ask the counterfactual. That if that doctor hadn't left Accra and gone to Manhattan, would he or she have gone to upcountry Ghana? Now, obviously can't answer that question. And a Ghanaian doctor came up to me at the end of a, of a presentation. He said, some doctors do. I did. Well, he's a politician, first and foremost. He's not practicing there now. But the point is taken. The point is taken that some will go up country. But it seems to me that the majority will not. Because if they do, in many ways, it's a waste of their talents to go up into isolated areas where they need not necessarily be running water, electricity, or adequate um, operating facilities. So and that's why we um, put a lot of emphasis on what's needed is appropriate training. If you train somebody to a global standard, they will move globally. All you need is to recruit locally, higher retention rates, and train to local levels. Always ensuring that these two systems are not mutually exclusive, that you can, one, you can jump from one to the other, either upwards or downwards. Downwards would be, I suppose, ideal against the brain drain. Um, always in this debate, always in this debate, there's the, 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 we tend to um, forget this, the immigration of appropriate skills. Um, in other words, the number of doctors who come from the developed world or other parts of the global south to help. Immigration of, 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 of medical skills. It's almost, it, it, I, I found was, was kind of discounted. And yet they are the ones who are in the most isolated areas of many parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Interestingly, Cubans. And one of the question that seems to be to be interest, when the, when um, the rapprochement between Cuba and the United States finally comes, as it will do. What impact is that going to have? Because then Cubans will be able to go to the United States. Not that the Cuban trained doctors will necessarily be able to practice, but they'll be able to become, do something else. Um, but it's an interesting, an interesting issue. But that, 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 uh, the, uh, the significance of outsourcing only applies in some parts of the world, and that's the, basically the development of hospitals for treatment of pe for people in the developed world. But I don't have time to go into that. All right, diasporas. I, I must move on. Um, obviously what they are. You know, can we, as they use the World Bank's term, leverage the diaspora to bring about development? Now, quite clearly, the importance of the overseas Chinese and the Viet Cue. These are the classic cases. Um, and they are participating in the rapid development of, Ch of southern China and southern Vietnam. Not so much northern Vietnam, but the Viet Cue are moving. They came from the south, they were primarily Sino Vietnamese, and they are participating in the southern development. They did not cause it. It seems to me, if we really want to put this debate in perspective, we do have to, and excuse me here, um, I do have to introduce, look at for a historical perspective. You know, what are the great diasporas we can look at historically? And quite clearly, there would be the Irish diaspora, and she picked up, my, picked up from my rather curious accent, the Scottish diaspora. And, and, and of course, a little country with five million people that claims 85 million people of Scottish descent uh, outside, beyond our borders. Uh, we, I mean, relative to what we call the Chinese diaspora, the Scottish diaspora is a real diaspora. But you know, we have to ask the question, what role did that diaspora play in Scotland's development? 
And you know, I think I think the jury's out in this one. Somebody like Carnegie, quite clearly trying to educate young Scots, establishing libraries and schools. And what the young Scots? I would like to be Andrew Carnegie. Let me get my education and get on that boat and go across to Pittsburgh and become like Andrew Carnegie. So, in some ways, the diaspora may encourage yet more migration. And obviously, the point at the bottom that not everybody in the diaspora has the best interests of the country of origin. And at heart, and there are several very good examples of that. Now, future issues beyond migration and development. I think we've got to change the nature of the debate. We've got to get back to the origins and we've got to bring development as the key issue here. How does development drive migration rather than migration drive development? How does it? Now, maybe you can tell me because you were looking at the drivers of migration. Um, but I think the need is for migration to be seen as primarily a consequence of development. And I've got been so, as, so rash as to suggest that what we need are mi migration impact statements in our development policy. In other words, if you're going to build a dam, we know more or less what's going to happen. And usually it's disastrous. But we know what's going to happen. So many, in uh, the case of, of, of the Three the, 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 the Gorges Project in China, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are going to be displaced. Uh, if you're going to uh, build a road, we can more or less, we can see the catchment areas and so on. But the impact of a trade policy may not be quite as obvious as that. Now, is this a sort of vague idea or can we really begin to look at such a thing? What impact is your urbanisation policy? What impact is that going to have on both internal and international migration? And that's where I think we need to, to be focusing on. If we're going to bring this debate forwards, And then, of course, my old saw that I always come back to, the links between internal and international migration. Inter internal migration needs to be incorporated as part of this debate. Otherwise, we're not really talking about the majority of people who move. And it's not just people who, internal migrants, who come down to Lima and then call up a cousin in New Jersey and who then go out to New Jersey. That happens. Yes, we got this step migration. It happens. But it's much more complicated than that because international migration can give rise to internal migrations, as we've seen in the case of Bangladesh. Salhet is the origin of 90, what, 98% of Bangladeshi migrants to, to London, one district in the northeast of Bangladesh. But not just that, it's that it's specific towns and villages within Salhet. And of course, there's a labor vacuum, and they suck in internal migra migrants from the surrounding. Areas. And I think if you look at Kerala, you can see similar um, uh, points. And the last one I'm just going to come to, international migration is a substitute for internal migration. So let me just move on to that. Oops. Ah, oh, no thing. My favorite example here is, is, is from Japan. Uh, one of the most, uh, Japan's population is already declining. Uh, aging, one of the fastest aging societies, and by 2050, it's got this wonderful coffin shape of the aged society. <laughs> <laughs> These black areas are the areas of uh, severe rural depopulation. If you just look amongst the numbers here, just down these two columns. These are local movers in Japan within the prefectures, and these are from one prefecture to another, from 1970 to 2008. Local movers declined from 4 million to 2.6 million, 4.2 million to 2.5 million. Some of you have seen this, these figures before, but I think it shows you know, quite a marked decline in internal migration in Japan. And interestingly, when in, in, in the presentations at the Hague yesterday, looking at both Spain and Poland, both of the percent percenters drew attention to the fact that internal migration had declined and that the, the, it was only the international migrants that were, that were responding to labor market opportunities in the countries. The internal migrants uh, were not moving so much. And, and, you know, it's the first time I'd heard this, but I think there's, the, the, could be some parallels with these more developed countries and countries that are coming well on the way through this demographic and migration transitions. So this migration is also linked, linked with this 
demographic transition. Because this is just a percentage of age group 20 to 34, which declines from 27% to 18%. This is the profile of a severely depopulated rural area. That's what it was in 1960, and this, the internal pyramid, is what it is uh, in 1990. Now, why would you send remittances back here? To support your old people? Possibly. But it, one thing we know in Japan is that old people are migrating to join the children of the towns. So, in other words, once you begin to take on these kinds of demographic profiles, it seems to me that's going to have a knock-on impact on the, the way that remittances are used. Hypothesis. This is just to show that it's not simply uh, Japan, and I mentioned Poland and Spain. This is the United States, that there's a long-term secular decline in internal migration in the United States since 1947 uh, to 2008, a data of William Frey in the United States. So migration with, within the United States of Americans is slowing. Interesting, there's a data gap there, not even the the wealthiest societies are immune from data problems. Um, but I think that this, this it, it's not simply demographic. I don't want to appear too much of a demographic determinist. There's issues of house ownership and quite, but I think the important thing is that although there are bumps, this long-term decline is not linked to economic cycles, short-term economic cycles. There's more going on here than simply um, boom and bust cycles. Now, just tying up, uh, moving towards an end so we can get into discussion. Uh, these are the rankings of countries today in terms of GDP at uh, market exchange rate. Uh, US top, Japan, China, Germany. And uh, these, this is the rank forecast, projected forecast, I think would be a better word, uh, by Price uh, Waterhouse Coopers uh, for 2050. Um, China, US is still there. India, Brazil, Japan, Russia, Mexico. Then the first European countries, Germany and the UK. Then Indonesia, which is one tends to be the quiet one of these rapidly developing economies. Indonesia, France and so on, Turkey. Uh, Nigeria down at 14. Um, now, if, if, this is a huge if, global economies move in this sort of way, the global migration pattern is going to adjust, given this path of future development. I mean, even if they're off by quite a margin. And it seems to me that the, the, north, the current North, as we define it, in other words, North America, uh, and po possibly more specifically Europe, are uh, not necessarily going to be the destinations of first choice for many uh, migrants. Uh, that, that we needn't necessarily look forward to continued and ever-increasing migration knocking at our gates. I think most obviously if Mexico is the seventh largest economy in the world, that is a huge intervening opportunity between the rest of Latin America and the United States. And if the US persists in keeping that border fairly tight, then Mexico, part of, not, not the whole country, because there are huge differences within these countries, but the central part of Mexico is likely to evolve as one of the main centers of economic dynamism in the future. So, you know, our migration development debate certainly has to move on from, gosh, everybody's going to go uh, to the present developed world and send remittances back home. This is, will be a very different pattern of international development and migration. And this is almost extra time, sorry. Um, in my little presentation. I should say something about the Global Forum of Migration and Development. I basically, and I have been involved, I think, directly or indirectly with every single one up until now. I'm not sure if I will get to, to Mauritius or whether they would even want it anywhere near Mauritius. Um, uh, the, a forum where issues of migration can be discussed among states is a good thing. Yes, that's positive. It's better than not discussing them. People might not agree, but the issues are put on the table, and you can see where the disagreements are. But as I said at the outset, development is not a major concern of the GFMD, despite its title. Be simply because the development people 
We used to send our development people, no longer. Sweden still, and one or two other countries, but it's the minority of countries that send development people. It's all migration people. So we're not discussing migration development. So therefore, should we change this talking shop to a global forum of development and migration? Hence, a re-emphasis on development in the way that Ravenstein conceptualized it, and a return to more academic approaches, a convergence between theory and practice, possibly. And then the last point, just to throw away, would a UN agency on migration be a good thing? No. no. And I won't say any more about that.